Hi, it's Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com. Keepingitfree.blogspot.com. I'm a lawyer in Northern California, a divorce lawyer who, from time to time here online, talks about criminal cases. Let's talk about the pizza bomber heist case. Right now, it is the focus of an excellent, and I do mean excellent, documentary on Netflix called Evil Genius that I recommend. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, it's May the 17th, 2018. Let's narrow our focus here. The focus of this video is on whether the pizza guy who robs a bank with a bomb strapped around his neck was an active participant in the crime. Let's give some background. A man, he's a pizza delivery man, Brian Wells walks into a bank with a bomb strapped around his neck, right? This happened in 2003. He has a cane. That's a gun, right? It's functional. If he pulls the trigger on the cane, bullets will come out the end of it. He grabs a lollipop from the lollipop bin. He slips a note to the teller that says that he himself is a hostage and that the bomb strapped around his neck underneath his shirt. In other words, when you look at the video, his shirt looks like this. It's clear that something's under it. He tells the teller that the bomb will go off unless he receives $250,000 and is allowed to deliver the money to the people who put the bomb around his neck. Now, he then gets almost $9,000 from the bank, far short of a quarter million dollars that his note demanded. Now, on his way out of the bank, according to witnesses, he looks relaxed. He even swings the cane that's a gun a little bit. He then heads to a nearby McDonald's where he gets a note from under a rock. Now that note is part of his scavenger hunt that he has to do to collect clues that will lead him to the people who have put the bomb around his neck so that one, he could deliver the money to them, and two, so that they can then take the bomb off his neck or tell him how to do so. Now, state troopers catch up to him inside a parked vehicle in the parking lot. Brian Wells tells them that he is the bank robber and that a group of black men put the bomb around his neck. The police handcuff Mr. Wells. As he has a bomb around his neck, they put him in the parking lot, they seat him in the parking lot, several feet away from everyone, right? The police then call the bomb squad. 20 minutes later, while the bomb squad is on their way, Right? The bomb starts beeping. Ten seconds after it starts beeping, the bomb goes off, killing Mr. Wells. Now the question for this video, and it's hotly debated. Right? Hotly debated. Mr. Wells has both supporters and detractors. But the question for this video is simply whether Brian Wells was a willing participant in the crime. I believe, based on these facts, the answer is yes. 
as in the Susan Smith case, as in the Amanda Knox case, as in the Jeffrey McDonald case, we now know that the accused here is referring to black people who don't exist. Let me repeat that. The accused here is referring to black people who don't exist. Simply put, it's one of the biggest facts of the case. It's one you should focus on. We now know, thanks to great police work and a confession with corroborating eyewitness testimony that the person who put the bomb around Mr. Wells' neck was Floyd Stockton, a white guy who was granted immunity. Mr. Stockton has confessed that he put the bomb around Brian Wells' neck. It was witnessed by Kenneth Barnes, who pleaded guilty to conspiring to rob a bank and to aiding and abetting. Mr. Barnes is also white. He was sentenced to 45 years. Marjorie Deal Armstrong and William A. Rothstein, according to these men, were also present. Right? And according to Barnes, planned the bank robbery. Right? Let me just say Marjorie was convicted of the crime and died in prison. Right? Rothstein died of cancer about a year after the crime took place and was never arrested. Now let me just make a clear point here. Right? It's a clear point. None of the people, again, none of the people who put the bomb around Brian Wells' neck were black. None of them. The black men cover story is part of the crime cover-up. So the question that must be asked here is why would Wells be telling this lie to police? And in my opinion, it's because he was in character. He was in his role as a co-conspirator. He was part of this crime and he lied to the cops in furtherance of it. Now we know that Brian Wells met with the other co-conspirators the day before the crime. There is a witness, a prostitute, who was there, Jessica Hoopsick. She's referenced in the Evil Genius documentary currently on Netflix. And she claims that Brian Wells didn't know what was going on. Right, that Brian Wells was just introduced to the group by her. The group was looking for a patsy. The group was looking for someone who didn't know what was going on, who they could use to do this crime. And if you believe Jessica Hoopsick, right, she had a customer, Brian Wells. She thought that Brian Wells would perfectly fit this role so she brought him by the house so that people could see him and make a decision on him. Right? Mr. Wells, of course, is not supposed to have known what was going on. According to the narrative being given by his supporters, he was just the guy who the next day delivered a pizza to an address next to Rothstein's house and then had the bomb put on him against his will. Just to understand that that's one version of events. Right? Dig a little deeper and you have the testimony of Barnes 
that in fact Brian Wells was actually fitted with the bomb. Right now, there is an open question on whether Brian Wells knew the bomb was going to be live or not. Right? Barnes claims that before they put the bomb on Wells the next day, that, Bar uh, that Wells got nervous and Barnes had to punch him in the face to calm him down. Right? He even fired a shot in the air so that Stockton would be able to get the bomb around Brian Wells's neck. There is the possibility, and I'll concede this here, that Brian Wells never agreed to have a live bomb on his neck. Right? But understand, in my opinion, based on these facts, based on Brian Wells's use of a cover story developed by his co-conspirators, even when he's in police custody, right? That Brian Wells, whether he agreed to the bomb being live or whether he agreed to have a dummy bomb on his neck as he did the crime, Brian Wells agreed to participate in the crime. Let me say this too. Marjorie Deal Armstrong in the show, Evil Genius, at one point in talking to an interviewer, says, hey, you know, um, how do you think we measured his neck for the bomb? Right? She hints at the fact that Brian Wells actually had his neck measured for the bomb. Brian Wells himself, in police custody, asks if the cops have called his employer because Wells wants to make sure that his employer doesn't feel that he's shirking his responsibilities. In other words, Wells went out to deliver a pizza and Wells wants to make sure that the employer understands that he hasn't returned for a reason. To these eyes, I get the feeling that Brian Wells did not know that the bomb was a live bomb. I believe he's playing in character, right? Using his plausible deniability in talking with the cops. In other words, he's in police custody. He doesn't want to expose his co-conspirators. So in character, he says, black guys who don't exist, put the bomb around my neck. Right? In character, he says, hey, look, you know, I'm a hostage myself. This bomb's around my neck, not by my choice. Right? I've been forced to do this crime. That's the prearranged cover story that he had to escape responsibility. So then in Wells' mind, just like the kid in the uh, Teresa Hallback case, right? In Wells' mind, if he's able to convince the police that he wasn't a willing participant in this crime, he'll be able to go back to work. Right? Just like the kid, I think his name was Brandon Daffy in the Stephen Avery case, thought that if he just spoke with the police, he'd be able to get home. Right? The truth, though, is that the guy was following instructions given him by his co-conspirators. Again, there's not one black man involved in putting the bomb around Wells's neck. Not one. Let me also point out too that Wells's next door neighbor talks about how Wells used to do scavenger hunts sponsored by the local newspaper. 
the local newspaper would leave things around town and would, you know, invite readers to try to find these items, right, in exchange for prizes. Brian Wells had an interest in doing those scavenger hunts. Now, he's introduced to these conspirators by a prostitute who knew him well. He was a regular customer. They actually had a friendship. Their relationship was ongoing, right? I'm guessing that when the conspirators were looking for someone to do the crime, they must have heard about Brian Wells from his friend, who must have told them that I have a guy who does scavenger hunts. I believe this crime may have even been designed with Brian Wells in mind. Understand, the call comes in to the pizzeria. Somebody else answers the phone, right? Brian Wells' boss. That person can't figure out what the caller is saying. So then, Brian Wells ends up with the phone. I believe this is by design. Right? Wells ends up with the phone. And then, of course, continues on with the plot. Wells knows where to go. Wells understands the caller. I'm guessing this is all by design. So Wells then goes to the scene. He knows the story. He sees a bunch of white people, right? He sees the people he's already met with the day before, right? He sees a bunch of white people. The bomb gets put on him, right? There's resistance by him because the bomb's not supposed to be a live bomb. The bomb's supposed to be a prop. But one thing is certain. The cover story is supposed to involve black men putting the bomb on him. That's what they tell Wells to say. That's exactly what Wells says when he's in police custody. Right? He's acting through the crime. I believe when the bomb starts beeping, that's the first time Wells knew with certainty that the bomb was a live bomb. Prior to that, he thought this episode would pass and he'd be able to get back to work. That's how I see it. I understand there are many opinions on this case. I understand that there's some conflicting testimony given by some witnesses. I also understand that some of the people involved have very unsavory pasts. Right? Floyd Stockton apparently was a rapist. Right? Uh, Barnes was the town crack dealer. Right? These are the people who come up with crazy crime ideas like this. Marjorie Deal Armstrong apparently had multiple boyfriends in the past turn up dead. Right? I have no doubt that many of the people involved in this crime were sociopaths and or psychopaths. But I also have little doubt that one of the people who agreed to do this crime was Brian Wells. Think about it. If you've gone to deliver a pizza and they slap a bomb around your neck and give you a caned gun, things that indicate a high level of planning, and then you walk into a bank and you feel that you only have a set amount of time to follow instructions before this bomb around your neck detonates, would you spend any time looking at a bin full of lollipops, taking one out, and then putting it in your mouth? Would you be thinking about a lollipop if moments prior you were just someone delivering a pizza, and now here you are 
with a bomb around your neck in a bank robbing it with a cane firearm right I believe in the bank Brian Wells was on top of the world right I believe he thought he was part of a great alibi crime where he could do the crime get paid a portion of a quarter million dollars that's what he thought he was gonna get from the bank that's what's in the note with the perfect cover story the perfect alibi if the cops busted him so he's almost giddy isn't he right grabs a lollipop he's leaving the bank now think about it there are many of us who if you've just been given a cane that's a firearm moments before wouldn't even want to lean on the cane for fear that it would go off right you would view this as a dangerous weapon handsome want a gun many people are going to be uncomfortable with it especially if they didn't know that they were going to be handed a gun and told that it was going to be part of them robbing a bank but yet Brian Wells is totally at ease holding this cane isn't he right eyewitnesses claim he's even swinging the cane a little bit you have a homemade gun in your hand a lot of people are going to be petrified of even holding it right I don't have the assurance that this gun has been built to the quality standards of Smith & Wesson right this gun may not be as safe to use as a Winchester rifle but yet Brian Wells trusts the gun just like I believe Brian Wells to his detriment to his death at the cost of his life trusted his co-conspirators who were the wrong people to trust who put a live bomb around his neck in a crime in which Wells agreed to participate with a dummy bomb that's how I see it let me hear from you I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video thanks for stopping by